Okay, so I think we'll begin. Thank you so much everyone for joining us today. My name is Amy Sam. I am the Health Education Project Specialist at the Maxwell and Eleanor Blum Patient and Family Learning Center at Mass General Hospital. Before we begin, just wanted to go over a few items with you all. Please note that this session is being recorded for educational purposes. If you're interested in viewing the recording of today's session, feel free to visit the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Please note everyone is in listen only mode. Everyone has been muted so that we can hear our guest speaker today. If you have any questions for our guest speaker, please use the chat feature, which is located at the bottom of your screen. We'll have time for them in the end. Only Blum Center staff and the guest speaker will see your questions. Please do not comment anything personal or ask any personal medical questions in the chat box. If you have a personal medical question, please ask a doctor. Okay, Dr. Blue, would you like to pull up your slides? Yeah, sure. Okay. So next we have Dr. Jennifer Blewett. She is a licensed clinical social worker at the MJH West End Clinic, an outpatient clinic specializing in treatment for those with substance use disorders and co-occurring mental health disorders. As a, as a clinician, Jennifer's interests are in the treatment of addictive disorders and co-occurring psychiatric disorders, cognitive behavioral therapy, treatment techniques, compulsive gambling, learning disabilities, and related health and social problems. In observance of Social Work Month, she joins us today to present on supporting families with mental health and substance use disorders treatment. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Blewett. Thank you so much. Um, so it is so wonderful to be with you all today, this afternoon. Um, really, really pleased to be back here uh, with the Blum Patient and Family Learning Center again to talk a little bit about how we can help support families, significant others, loved ones that have someone in their life with a mental health and substance use disorder and how to support them and help them kind of navigate treatment and better understand it. There we go. Um, so I have no disclosures today. I'm not an active researcher. I have no affiliation with the pharmaceutical industry. I'm not a healthcare economist. I am a direct practice clinical social worker here and I work at Mass General Hospital. I've had the opportunity of working in the Department of Psychiatry for close to eight years, and I work in outpatient um, substance use addiction treatment. So really pleased to be spending my time with you today and, and talk a little bit about um, something that I think is, is probably close to many people's hearts. So some of the objectives that I wanna review for today with you all during this presentation is a little bit about um, how mental health and substance use disorders impact us and really what are those most common mental health and substance use disorders. I also want to create an understanding of why there's such an increased need for treatment right now for mental health and substance use disorders um, and, and maybe the impact that we've seen from the pandemic. Additionally, I'd like to provide an overview of mental health and substance use disorders treatments and kind of continuum of care. And I'd like to help describe what are some of the best supports to help people um, who have a mental health or substance use disorder or psychological change get into treatment and what that treatment looks like. And then also what we can do in a crisis, whether it's a psychiatric or mental health or addiction crisis. And then last but not least, I wanna take a few minutes just to review some of the available resources that we have, not just in the Eastern Massachusetts community, but what are some of the uh, resources that we have that are available to friends and family and, and loved ones? So, so why, why is mental health and substance use disorders and treatment and support, why, why is that important? Well, I think it can be summed up in the fact that mental health and health as you know, a whole are very interconnected and they're very important when it comes to living a, a long and healthy life. Um, you know, more than ever, there is such an increased need for mental health and substance use treatment and behavioral health care. The COVID-19 novel pandemic has certainly impacted mental health treatment and substance use treatment and how we access care more than ever. Far before the COVID-19 pandemic, there was already an epidemic when it came to access to treatment for those struggling with mental health, psychiatric, psychological, and addiction needs. So the COVID-19 pandemic certainly uh, made things 
a little bit worse and a little bit more challenging and, and certainly increase people's anxiety and depression. And we've seen an increase overall in our population of adults in substance use. But the good thing about the pandemic is we've really opened up telehealth care and we've opened up people's access and ability to access treatment, um, which is good because right now more than ever, there is such an increased need for treatment um, and an increased need for access to good care. Um, more than ever, we've got people with burnout and strain who are working in um, frontline care providing facilities or grocery stores or working in jobs where they haven't had the opportunity to work from home. And it's important that we recognize some of those mental health risks that are associated both with COVID-19, um, with working you know, during an international pandemic, but also recognizing the need that mental health and health are really attribute, attributed to poor physical health. And it's important to recognize that. Um, in our country right now, about one in four adults on average experiences a mental health condition in a given year. And most people actually experience both a mental health and a substance use co-occurring uh, addiction or problem at the same time. So anxiety and depression, as well as alcohol use problems or problems with cocaine and um, maybe personality disorder or a need for um, an eating disorder treatment center. So we've got those that we need to care for as well. In America right now, we've got youth mental health that is worsening more than ever. And we're also seeing increases in youth substance use that's worsening. And it's, it's interesting because worldwide, we have about 350 million people who are estimated to have tried an illicit drug last year in 2020. And people on average wait about 10 years before they actually seek treatment out for mental health and substance use disorders. And that puts them at an increased risk too, because we know that the sooner you can get into treatment, um, the better your patient and treatment outcomes will be. And then last but not least, it's, it's interesting because in America as a culture, we actually have more access to services than ever because of mental health parity laws, but also because of health insurance. However, we do still have a lot of Americans who lack the access to care. So how do we get them connected to the good treatment, the right treatment? Because um, a lot of some of the substance use and mental health conditions I'll be talking about today are very treatable conditions. And so when we think about some of these treatable conditions, it's important to think about some of the causes and risk factors. You know, How did some of um, what's going on maybe with our friend or our family member or our loved one, how did that kind of develop? And we know that um, from a clinical standpoint, when we look at patients with uh, mental health or substance use addiction risk factors, or they've got certain comorbidities, we know that patients that have certain genetic makeup or kind of have this predisposition to developing certain addiction as well as mental health conditions. And so all of these factors here, including like the sociocultural and environmental um, factor in this kind of um, diagram, as you can see where you went to school, who you work with, your peer group, what your culture and family circumstances like, that has an interaction with, for example, your personality or the psychological piece, your attitudes and beliefs and coping skills, your temperament and, and you know, perceptions, that all really contributes as a whole as to what the experience of the individual or family member has with mental health and substance use. Um, and then we have to consider the last part of the diagram, which is the biological piece, the biology, really the genetic makeup. And are there um, you know, certain pieces of physical health or our immune response? Is there not just a mental health or psychological condition? Is there also a comorbid um, or co-occurring substance use disorder or comorbid um, severe health condition? Are there genetic vulnerabilities? And so the biological, the social and the psychological pieces in this diagram all interact with each other and really become factors for how they contribute to somebody's experience with health and mental health and substance use disorders. And also gives us a little bit of feedback and understanding on what is going to be the implication for someone in terms of getting into treatment and how resilient they will be. And so I think one of the things that would be really helpful to do today is to give a little bit of a background on common mental health conditions and psychiatric disorders, as well as common substance use and addictive behaviors. I think it's really important that we talk a little bit about what some of those common disorders look like and how they may be impacting you. I think the, the best patient and the best family member is an informed and educated one. So probably there's a lot of um, people who have 
an understanding of some of these disorders or familiarity, um, especially when we look at like, you know, movies and the internet and television. But I think it's important that if I just review a few of the more common ones. So when we take a look, you know, anxiety disorders, that's a really common mental health or, or condition that we see in behavioral health when we think of like anxiety, uh, social phobias, panic disorders, other phobias, generalized uh, anxiety disorders. Depression is almost as common as anxiety. I think those almost kind of go hand in hand at times when we have patients who are really struggling and trying to adapt and are feeling overwhelmed. Um, depressive disorders kind of have an overall arching umbrella of what they encompass, but a lot of our patients, and probably you've heard a lot about people having depressive episodes or feeling down or depressed or having depressed mood. Um, other disorders are like major depressive disorder. With the COVID-19 pandemic and just the world in the kind of state that it's in today, we're certainly seeing an increase in stress-related disorders. And that can be anything from post-traumatic stress disorder to acute stress disorders, adjustment disorders. Then we've got some of the more um, uh, related disorders to so like bipolar with mania and low depressed mood. Then we've got more chronic psychiatric conditions like schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders. Obsessive compulsive disorders is probably one that people are familiar with. And then dissociative disorders. Some of you may have heard the term or the diagnosis of dissociative identity disorder. Eating disorders are something that I think there's a, a little bit of familiarity with and a common psychiatric disorder. Um, when we think of like anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa and then sleep disorders. I think one of the silver linings of the pandemic right now is people are understanding more and more the importance and the necessity to get good sleep and to have effective sleep and not just go upstairs and lay down with a, you know, a tablet or a computer, but really have a good understanding of how um, good sleep and practicing good sleep hygiene is so important for them. Um, things like narcolepsy and insomnia are certainly part of that sleep disorder category. And it's really important, especially if you have a, a mental health symptom or worsening mental health condition or um, a substance use disorder to really practice good sleep hygiene and make sure that you're taking care of yourself as best as you can. Um, and then personality disorders like borderline personality disorder is something that we, um, we commonly hear and, and have patients that are diagnosed with. Um, on the flip side, we've got substance use disorders and other addictive behaviors. Um, I think we certainly are seeing an increase in patients seeking treatment and seeking care for substance use and other addictive behaviors, which I think is fantastic. The downside is I think the, the substance use in this country and especially across the world because of the pandemic has certainly increased. And so that means we've got more people than ever that need treatment, they need to access treatment and they need to be educated about what the right treatment is for them. So some of the more popular um, or common substance use disorders that we see within treatment facilities are alcohol related disorders like alcohol use disorder. We certainly are seeing an increase in cannabis use. And so when we look at cannabis related disorders like direct cannabis use, marijuana use, um, synthetic cannabis use, that's certainly something we're seeing more when people are vaping or using other forms um, of cannabis. Also opioid related disorders. Uh, using substances like heroin, fentanyl, oxycodone, uh, misusing or using illicit uh, opioids is, is something that we see frequently. Other common disorders in substance use or just substance use behavior include stimulant related disorders. And that can really include like cocaine use or methamphetamine use. And then we also know about misuse of, or illicit use of anti-anxiety or sedatives as well as inhalants is something that we may have some understanding or commonality with. And then something we're seeing more of is hallucinogens when we think about like LSD, but more so like mushrooms when we think about what kind of the, the current community may be using. And then tobacco and nicotine related disorders. That is something that I think sometimes people think maybe isn't um, a disorder that would fall under the category of like mental health, behavioral health, addiction treatment, but it very much is. Um, actually reducing your tobacco and nicotine use while in recovery or while trying to become um, someone engaged in recovery can actually help you to not only have longer abstinence from a substance, but more success in terms of what you're able to do in terms of outcomes for your treatment with a substance use disorder. Um, in terms of other addictive behaviors, I think sometimes we don't include these as being 
quote unquote major substance use disorders, but they're definitely part of the umbrella of other addictions. And it, it's something that can very much cause and wreak havoc on a family system if we don't take care of some of these other addictive compulsive behaviors. So when we think about patients who are struggling with compulsive sexual behaviors, um, pathological or compulsive gambling, we've certainly seen an increase in online gaming disorders, uh, not just for people who are gambling, but um, like obsessive and compulsive use of video games online, especially with all the new streaming outlets that we have. And then when we think also about excessive computer and internet use, people are certainly using the internet um, for everything now. It sometimes feels like I'm on the computer 12 to 15 to 16 to 18 hours a day. It feels like I never leave it because I'm there for work. I'm there to also stream things. I'm looking up things, they're shopping. You know, It just becomes sometimes excessive when we think about people's computer and internet use. And then last but not least, shopping and compulsive spending. Um, something that I think people have long heard about or thought about is kind of um, a shopping addiction, but that's something very much that's a common behavior that we see. And so the next question is really what to do when, how to help, how can you help your friend? How can you um, not enable them, but really care for them and support a friend, a loved one, a family member um, that may have some potential uh, symptoms or warning signs that you're starting to recognize? I think the best thing that always do is really be able to pay attention to sudden changes. Um, anytime there's a sudden change with a mood or um, a psychological change or a behavior, maybe like a loss in weight, unintended weight loss, I think it's important to really see that as potentially something is going on, especially when it's so sudden. Um, by recognizing these symptoms and paying attention to these sudden changes, I think it can help us to be better prepared and better equipped to meet with one of our friends or family members and let them know that we're there, we're supportive, but something's up and we're concerned. And you know, how can we work as a team to maybe look at this? And so what you wanna do when you wanna to try to help your loved, or loved one or family member that may or may not have an alcohol, um, a substance use disorder, illicit substance use disorder, maybe a behavioral change that there's like a psychiatric change or psychological change, a mental health disorder, it's really important to kind of just step back for a second and evaluate the situation and kind of think, how, how bad is this problem? Do we have a problem? And then you wanna evaluate the physical health or appearance. What's the mood or emotional behavior like? Um, you know, are they kind of experiencing highs and lows? Are they aggravated? Are they agitated? Um, are they kind of always a lot of high mood all the time? Do they feel like they're maybe doing some things excessively or obsessively? Those are things to look at as well. We also want to take into consideration the safety factors. What's going on there? So pay attention to any sort of suicidal thoughts or gestures, um, potentially plans. Maybe people are um, inferring to suicidal or unsafe thoughts. That's important to really take a look and, and examine that. And then social withdrawal, I think we see this all the time. You know, has there been a change in like attitude, but has there more so been a change in people not engaging in the behaviors that they once engaged in that they used to like engaging in? You know, kind of what has been the change there? And are we finding that people maybe aren't doing some of the things that they used to do? And then also occupational and educational status. Are people not in school anymore? Have people dropped out? Has a school or educational um, you know, environment asks them to step away or take some time off? Have there been occupational changes? Maybe someone's having trouble getting a job or retaining a job. Maybe somebody has been informed that they're no longer gonna be at their job or they've been asked to take some time off, maybe get some help. That's an important kind of red flag too to think about, you know, what's the impact here and what's going on. And then last but not least, you know, when we're taking a look and we're evaluating the situation and wondering about some of these sudden changes, has there been an increase or an onset of substance use behavior um, or problematic substance use? Um, that's something I think to really evaluate as well. You know, I think it's always really helpful to uh, try to prevent a crisis. And I think you can do that by talking with the, the individual. You can do that by meeting with someone, letting them know that you care about them, that you want to help them, that you're coming from a supportive, empathetic stance. And, you know, I think it sometimes can help too to reach out to people in your life who are providers or physicians, other treatment programs, maybe tell them that what you're seeing is concerning and how could you potentially get help for the family member. But at the end of the day, you always want to avoid stigma and come from a judge, a non-judgmental stance and use non-judgmental language. 
You really want to show compassion to the family member or friend. You really want to encourage them to engage in treatment if it feels like that's the right fit. And you want them to get help if they need it. And you do that by using non-stigmatizing behaviors. So I created this little uh, slide here that I think is really helpful. You know, I think there is um, an interest by a lot of family members and friends and loved ones and coworkers and parents to want to get help for their loved one or friend, um, you know, really want to support their spouse or their adult child or their sibling or their coworker. And they want to show them that they care and they love them. But there's definitely some do's and don'ts of how you go about supporting someone. Um, so you want to make sure that you have a plan from the beginning. So do have a plan from the beginning. If you're going to go ahead and try to help someone, don't be reactive. Really take a moment to, to think about how am I going to talk with them and do um, my best to explain from a, a compassionate, non-judgmental stance how I want to help them, how I want to get them into treatment, or how I just want to listen and let them know that I'm there. Don't make decisions without their consent. Don't gather a bunch of people and say, you know, we're going to surprise this person and tell them that we're, you know, having an intervention or we're going to meet with them. Don't, uh, you know, have them meet you somewhere and have it be a treatment center. You really want to include the individual um, who's having somewhat of a, a problem or a crisis or is having increasing worrisome symptoms that you're there and that you want them to be part of the decision that you're making in terms of getting them help. Do set reasonable expectations up front for yourself, for your family, for your loved one. Don't blame or shame them. Do make sure to name your needs and boundaries clearly. So if you need someone to leave your home because there's a child in the home or because you, know, you want it to be a safe environment, make that very clear. If you need to maintain your job or your living situation and you need to continue making money and working from home, but you've got an erratic or chaotic situation at your home, make sure to have your boundaries there so that you know that the patient knows kind of what is expected and what is going to be a boundary that if they can't stay within that they, you know, you may have to set guidelines so that you can keep people safe around them and around you. Don't personalize their behavior, you know, really don't define the patient by a diagnosis or, a, you know, by their symptoms. Do practice really good self-care for yourself. You know, I think during this process or any sort of crisis, we have a tendency to kind of like batten down the hatches and how can we help people? And, you know, yeah, I've got stuff going on in my own life, but let me take care of them first and then I'll take care of myself. And that's really not what you want to do. You want to seek out support for yourself. Maybe you're seeing a therapist, maybe you're getting counseling, maybe you're going to a support group. Make sure that you're taking care of yourself, you're sleeping well, because if you can't take care of yourself, how are you going to have the ability to support the others in your life that need you? Don't wait until your resentment comes up. You know, communication and trust during this time of trying to get a family member help is so key. And we really wanna make sure that we are communicating effectively with the person and with the family unit so that we don't have resentment, we don't have anger. We really want to make sure that we're clear on where we're coming from. And you do that by communicating along the way. Do kindly step back when you need to. There's obviously certain safety circumstances where we wanna make sure we don't step back in those circumstances, but there are times when it's good for you and it's good for the individual who's struggling for everyone to kind of take a step back, let the dust settle and figure out how do we want to go through with this plan? How can we help you? How can we support you? You don't do that by ignoring them though. Don't avoid them, don't ignore them. You know, if you get a text message and it kind of is upsetting to you or scares you or makes you think, oh my God, I don't wanna deal with that. You do have to find a way to help them. And so how you do that is don't ignore, don't ignore them, but let them know kind of like we mentioned before, here's our boundaries, here's what I need, but how can we get you help? How can we be supportive? And you have to understand that as a family member or a friend, that this is not gonna be easy. You have to understand that being supportive during a crisis or chaos is never easy. And always make sure to, to learn about the diagnosis or the treatment symptoms or the symptoms that you need treatment for, and don't define the person by it. Really do your best not to define patients or define your family members or friends by a diagnosis. That's just creating more public and self uh, stigma. And so one of the ways that we help support people in our lives that are maybe struggling with a substance use or mental health condition um, is really to help them get into treatment. And, and I think one of the biggest things that's so hard for family members and friends is how do you go about navigating treatment? How do you go about understanding, you know, kind of the continuum of treatment for those with a mental health condition? Um, 
you know, you do that by just continuing to educate yourself. And that's why you're probably attending this today or watching this video is, is how can I better understand what's going on so I can educate myself so I can be an advocate from just not only my family, but my family member, my friend, whoever you're looking to get help with or support. And so this is the continuum, um, kind of a brief overview, a kind of um, quickie, if you will, of how the continuum of mental health treatment really um, is. You know, what are the services? What do they kind of include? And so when we look at kind of the more intensive emergency services that are more restrictive, we think of like acute intervention crisis services, that would be someone that could come to someone's home um, or come to their work or come to an emergency room and do like an on-demand, in-the-moment psychiatric evaluation and assessment. And then most common um, that we hear a lot about, and, and unfortunately, I think Hollywood has sensationalized some of um, our mental health and substance use treatment, but a lot of people will be familiar with an inpatient psychiatric hospitalization. That is the most restrictive environment. It's also the most safe service. And it's, it's also probably the most intense service. So an inpatient psychiatric hospitalization is a place where people can get treatment when there's a real emergency or crisis going on. Um, and, and there should be no stigma or shame or guilt about going into treatment. If you need treatment, you need treatment and let's get you connected. Um, the sooner you can get connected with treatment, the better you're gonna, you're gonna feel, the better your health outcomes will be, um, and the more safe that you and your family will remain. Um, when we think of some less restrictive environments, um, long-term and short-term residential treatment programs are certainly available. Uh, short-term can be anything, uh, you know, that's like seven to 10 days to maybe 28 days or a month. Long-term treatment could certainly include something that's longer, like three or six months, um, a year maybe even. Those residential environments are less restrictive and they're less intense in an inpatient psychiatric hospitalization, but they include you know, an interdisciplinary team that's working with the patient, there's group therapy, there's supportive uh, individual therapy, sometimes there's family therapy provided, there's a treatment team, you have the ability to not be isolated because you're around other patients, and you reside at the program, you sleep overnight there. Less restrictive, but somewhat still intense programs uh, that are outpatient include like a partial hospitalization program, um, which can be a couple of weeks where you go like Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. to get treatment. And then intensive outpatient group programs, which are a, a few less days of the week and a few less hours of the week, but sometimes those are a couple weeks to like a month. And those are great ways to get a lot of treatment in a short amount of time. Um, in, and hopefully with the idea that you've left like an inpatient or a residential setting and you've stepped down to some of these intensive outpatient settings. Individual counseling or group therapy, um, those are really great ways to get involved in long-term, less intense basic treatment. So they're, they're less restrictive. They allow you to go to group therapy once a week for an hour or, or therapy with a provider or um, you know, a psychologist or clinical social worker a couple of times a month, once a week, every other week. Therapy can be really great for long-term treatment to engage in, also long-term um, positive benefits. Same with group therapy. It's so important to get engaged in a group because you have the ability to receive really good clinical care in a group setting while receiving support with other people. And then once again, seeing a psychiatrist or other medical provider and doing some sort of medication management or, or psychopharmacology where there's a prescription um, that's provided. Also couples and family therapy, I can't speak highly enough. You know, the, the more that people in, involved um, are with the individual who's struggling with mental health or substance use disorders, the better off that patient's gonna be by having the family involved in treatment, but also the family can start to take care of themselves as well. And it really is a team effort. Um, just like I kind of went over with mental health treatment and that continuum of care, the continuum of substance use treatment is, is pretty similar, where we're starting at the top with much more intensive, restrictive forms of treatment, and we're kind of working our way down to less restrictive. So an inpatient hospitalization for a substance use disorder may include uh, inpatient detoxification, where you're actually having the substance leave the body in a safe way, where no one's going to put themselves at risk or harm. A lot of patients will find that they are struggling or really combating like a mental health and a substance use disorder. So like a co-occurring co substance um, and mental health issue that would include like anxiety and alcohol use um, or obsessive compulsive and um, you know, cocaine use. And, and maybe you want to be seen for some form of higher treatment. So you would do like an inpatient hospitalization with a co-occurring dual diagnosis hospitalization. 
Um, once again, just like for uh, mental health treatments, there are long-term and short-term residential treatment programs. Um, those can be very helpful because they're, they're intensive in that there's a lot of group therapy, there's a lot of individual therapy, family therapy, you have an interdisciplinary team taking care of you, but it's not an inpatient hospitalization unit. So you probably can go for walks during the day, it's less restrictive. And most people will leave like a short-term or long-term residential treatment program and move down, you know, in terms of levels of care to less restrictive, less intense, like a partial hospitalization program, intensive outpatient treatment, They'll move on to individualized treatment like therapy, um, which would also include like individual counseling or psychopharmacology with a psychiatrist. And then also there's addiction treatment medication programs. When we've heard of like um, methadone maintenance treatment programs, uh, Suboxone. Those are some just basic examples of opioid use disorder treatment that also you know, includes like going to a program where you get basic counseling and support um, as well as your medication. And then group therapy, I really can't say enough about how effective and how encouraged and it's just strongly recommended from my clinical point of view that if you have someone in your life who's really struggling um, with an addiction or substance use disorders to get them into some form of group psychotherapy, group counseling, group therapy to really find um, a less isolating environment to kind of work on what's going on and, and talk about the support and treatment that they, that they need and that they wanna continue receiving. And then we'll talk a little bit more about 12 step support groups coming up. Um, but last but not least, I can't tell you how effective and important getting the family involved in some form of treatment um, while someone's also engaged in substance use treatment. And so here are some um, really great examples of like complementing other standard treatment approaches. So these are approaches that, you know, necessarily wouldn't happen in like a hospital or clinical setting, but very much play a huge role as part of like the recipe to success for patients getting engaged in treatment for mental health and substance use disorders. So it's really, really important to have people understand that these are different areas that they can get treatment for, but you shouldn't just kind of like pick one treatment, just go to detox or just go to an inpatient hospitalization or just do a partial program. There's usually a continuum of care and treatment that you engage in. Um, and so for a lot of our patients at the hospital and probably some people that you've maybe engaged with before um, who are struggling or have a mental health or substance use disorder, you'll find that couples and family and significant support of other therapies are really important to their success in getting better and feeling better. Also, there's a ton of patient family education programs out there. Um, NAMI, the um, uh, NAMI, they have a great program called NAMI Connection and they have the ability to really get people connected and kind of do like a short course for families who want education programs. Um, one of the great things about Mass General Hospital is it doesn't matter what part of your care you're in, if you're in inpatient treatment, if you're in the hospital, the emergency room, if you're in outpatient care, we have the ability to have wonderful case managers and clinical social workers help to coordinate, make referrals, help families and patients really navigate the treatment process as to where they're going to go after they've left the hospital or where they're going to go in the future. And then 12-step groups like AA and self-help groups, those are super important to add in to kind of the whole recipe of getting care and treatment. Uh, peer recovery support services are certainly something we're seeing more of like recovery coaches, sponsors, sober coaches, life coaches. It's important for the patient to engage in exercise, physical activity, really practice mindfulness and therapeutic practices like meditation and yoga. Um, and also last but not least, animal assisted therapy. Um, pet therapy really helps patients to just learn to cope better and, and kind of deal with some of, some of the stressors that they're managing. Um, some support group resources. I know I mentioned a little bit about how important it is for family members to get into support groups, but it's so important for the individual member, the patient, or your friend, family member, loved one who's struggling with a mental health or substance use disorder to get into some sort of support group. Now, these are in addition to the clinical groups that are run um, like at a hospital or an outpatient community-based center, but support groups are huge. They're one of the best resources for patients and family members. And it really can be such a great way to receive free treatment, free um, education and free psychoeducation about our health and psychiatry and mental health and substance use needs by going to one of these groups one of the greatest things about the pandemic is we've had the ability to have these groups basically all offered virtually. So if you want to go to an Alcoholics Anonymous group at 10 o'clock at night, there's a group. Um, if you want to, you know, attend a Gamblers Anonymous group, you can do that. There's groups for everyone and everything. 
Narcotics Anonymous is also a well-known group that people attend to. So um, I do believe that my, uh, my presentation and these slides will be posted at some point online, but if you guys want, you're certainly welcome to screenshot this. Uh, support group resources is something I really encourage people to look into and um, connect with. And, and if, you, if you didn't like it the first time you went, I encourage you to kind of keep going and find the group that, that best fits you and your family. And so what do you do in a crisis? You know, we have a friend, a family member, a colleague, a loved one who's struggling with a mental health or substance use disorder, and it's becoming more and more apparent that something's going on. And so how do you support them? What do you do? Um, the first and foremost thing that you want to do is you want to know the warning signs of when things seem to be worsening, problems, symptoms, conditions. Then you really want to evaluate the situation, but also at the same time, remain calm you know, keep a level head about like, how are we going to plan to help this person? This, is this a crisis? What do we do? How do we evaluate it? Avoid overreacting and remain being supportive. Listen to the person or the patient and ask how you can help. Express support, but also make sure that you understand that, that they understand that you also have concern. You're coming from a supportive, non-judgmental stance, but that you are worried. Make sure that you don't argue with the patient and try to, you know, try not to reason with them. You don't want to barter a reason or enable with them. And offer options instead of trying to take control in a crisis or a certain situation. And when in doubt, give the person space. If it's safe to do that, um, set boundaries or limits. Okay, you know, this isn't a conversation we can have now. Um, you know, I'm going to give you a call at eight o'clock tonight or I'm stopping back over at 5 p.m. Talk with a doctor or a provider, reach out to a mental health provider if you think there really is a crisis situation. And when in doubt, if it is a crisis situation, call 911, initiate emergency services and contact a medical provider so that you can get a medical response. And so I think it's very important that I underline the impact that mental health and substance use disorders, doesn't matter if they're acute, if they're chronic, um, they have an impact on the entire family. Uh, mental health you know, disorders, mental health symptoms, psychological conditions, substance use disorders, other addictive disorders, they all impact the family on every level. That includes the emotional level, the psychological level, the financial level, the occupational level, the social and the legal and criminal level. It's important for us to understand that they have the ability if they go untreated and uncared for to really have an impact, not on only the individual, but also on the family as a whole. And so the sooner you can identify red flags, the sooner you can tell someone that you know, you know you've seen something or witnessed something or that you're concerned, the sooner you can get them into care and treatment and get them the help that they need. And so coping as a family, you know, it's really hard to know what's next as a family. Where do we go from there? How do we cope? How do we cope as a family unit when someone's maybe struggling um, or identifying a significant or problematic mental health condition, symptom, or substance use disorder? And so how do we go about supporting a friend or family member with a mental health condition or a substance use disorder? Where do we start? Well, first and foremost, you want to learn about the mental health or substance use conditions. And you want to also learn about what are the treatments available? What's the continuum of care look like? Um, what maybe has been helpful in the past? What we could do now? What could be um, some sort of treatment that you could advocate as a family for the patient? And you do that by learning more and more about the mental health and substance use conditions. You want to really have an improved recognition of early signs of mental health problems with a goal of preventing a crisis. And you wanna have a basic plan for mental health emergencies. And you wanna be able to really be able to advocate for the patient, but also work through times of chaos. And so really understanding what a mental health emergency might look for for your family, like look at for your family or also what that might look like for a family member is important to kind of have that understanding. And then you want to have realistic expectations and you want to accept partial solutions. So really being able to take a step back and understand that there may be times when a patient is willing to go into treatment or maybe not the treatment that you want them to go into, or maybe they've stopped using one substance but hasn't stopped another substance. It's important to have realistic expectations for yourself and for the family member. 
And when in doubt, always encourage the family member to follow through with treatment, adhere to treatment. I think sometimes that we can have a form of um, compassion and support and advocacy for a patient where, you know, they've been in a treatment program for a period of time and we want them to have success, but they're also saying that they want to come home. It's best that they stay with the treatment that's been prescribed and that they finish out the treatment that they've been um, in or they, they've been recommended to attend as part of a treatment plan. It's important to set healthy boundaries. It's incredibly important to rebuild those trusting relationships and communication that may have broken down at another point as a family due to the kind of increasing or problematic mental health and substance use disorders. It's important to help address potential barriers. You've got to find support for yourself and take care of yourself. You've got to establish a support network for you and your family. You've got to go to support groups, maybe therapy, find a way to take care of yourself. And you've got to accept your feelings. There may be times that you're angry or you're mad or you're sad and you need to acknowledge them and not ignore them. And try to create joy around you if you can. Try to find things that help you, support you and support your family members and, and really try to find ways to create the joy around you but also recognize and manage stressors. Because at the end of the day, recovery is stronger when all of the family members understand the nature of the mental health and the substance use disorder, and then get involved in the whole healing process. And so as we start to wrap up my presentation a little bit, I do want to uh, just show you here what we have or some resources for you guys. So I could have probably made a thousand slides on resources for self-help and support groups in the community, for family resources, uh, for resources that are kind of like global resources, resources for, for people who just want to call like a hotline. Um, but I have got a couple of slides here that just, if you guys want to screenshot or look at the, the presentation at a later date, that you guys can engage in. And so there's so many resources out there. Um, the National Association of Mental Illness, you know, has a family to family program that's really great. It's like a short-term learning um, module that you can engage in to figure out how to support loved ones and family members in your life with a mental health or substance use disorder. They've also got this really great workbook that's navigating a mental health crisis that's for free online. Um, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services um, Association, they have an actual behavioral health treatment services locator. So if your friend or family member or yourself isn't engaged in treatment, um, doesn't have a primary care doctor, doesn't have you know, connections to healthcare providers, you can advocate and find and research some of the healthcare and behavioral health treatment services in your facility, I mean, in your vicinity and certain facilities you may want to um, go to for treatment or care, at least call and um, potentially make a referral for. There's lots of great websites that provide wonderful health and psychoeducation. Um, you know, one of the things that's really great is the Addiction Guide for Family Members that's on the American Addiction Center's website. But one thing that's really important is the, uh, the ability that I'm seeing right now on providers and patients' behalf to really be innovative and creative. And we're seeing more and more than ever, lots of great family resources, um, lots of great apps for your smartphones, and, and a lot of really great resources out there for people. Um, one of the resources that I wanna give a shout out to is for patients that have a, an addiction or substance use disorder history. And for a lot of people, they've had to take time off from treatment or if they've lost their jobs, um, but they wanna get back into the job force. And how do they do that in a way that supports their recovery? Well, one of, the, one of the programs we have here at Mass General Hospital called Recovery Works is one of those programs that helps support family members who want to get back into the work environment who have a substance use disorder history and, and how do you support them and educate them to get them back into the field. And it's a great, really innovative service that we're offering now. In addition to a lot of these family resources, I totally recommend you all attend as many of the Blum uh, Patient and Family Learning Center uh, talks that you can. They're incredibly great when it comes to advocacy and education. And then these are additional supportive resources that I've provided. Um, these are resources that you can use to do some research for yourself or to think um, kind of globally about how you could support a friend or family member with mental health or substance use disorders. These are some of the kind of the major overarching um, areas that you can find support uh, with, you know, uh, or information, education, whether it's for yourself or a loved one. And then these are the national resources. So this is probably what I would recommend, you know, pre- uh, you know, the internet, when people were really desperate to get contact with someone, to feel less isolated, to talk with someone, maybe even to figure out, you know, 
What do I have that's going on? Is it a problem? Do I need to seek help? Should I go to an emergency room? So a lot of these crisis hotlines are really great networks that you can call as either an individual that feels that they might be struggling or they need help or a family member. So I recommend you guys totally follow up with some of these resources. And last but not least, one of my favorite quotes from Catherine Center, we are all at our finest when we take care of each other. And that includes ourselves, our loved ones, our friends, our colleagues. And we do that really by checking in on them, especially during this pandemic. So uh, that's it for me, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really been a pleasure to have an opportunity to, to spend an hour with you guys today and, and to talk a little bit about how to support our family, friends, and loved ones with, with mental health and substance use disorders. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Blue, for your help with your presentation. We are now toward the end of the session. So if you have any questions for Dr. Blewett, feel free to enter them in the chat box. So we have a couple of questions for you, Dr. Blewett. All right. How can a parent support adult child to continue with counseling or treatment when they are not allowed access to the progress of the person? Mm. So it gets hard when an individual and an adult is over 18 because there is less parent and family involvement just because of the way it is when it comes to confidentiality and privacy. What I recommend is to have kind of a level playing field and let the individual or family member know that you want to be supportive. You wanna be part of the team. You want to really support them and advocate for them and you're there for them. And it's not out of, um, you know, distrust or it's not out of blaming. It's more out of just concern and wanting to be part of the family unit. And so, you know, I would encourage them to be attending treatment and seeking treatment, but at the same time, I would be making sure that I'm modeling that I'm going to family treatment or couples treatment, or I'm going to a drop-in family support group. We've got one that happens at Mass General for patients with substance use disorders and their families that they can drop in every Thursday. You know, make sure that you're involved in treatment and make sure that the family member knows that like you and your husband are engaged in care and you're working at going to Al-Anon or other support groups. And we hope that you're also involved in care too. And is there anything that we can do for you? We're always here to listen. I think coming from a really non-judgmental, compassionate stance will always help. But yeah, you're kind of stuck in that situation because you can't really monitor if they're going to treatment or engage. I think the best thing you can do is improve trust and communication and that information will come along. Thank you. We have someone who commented that MGH has a great recovery coach program. Would you like to share more information about that resource? Absolutely. So as I mentioned a little bit in the continuum of care for addiction and substance use disorders, we are seeing a lot more of these alternative really wonderful complementary programs. And not only do we have kind of a, a past field of like sober coaches and, and life coaches, but we've got something even better now, which are recovery coaches. And they're in bed within our emergency department without within our um, community-based recovery programs. When we look at some of the programs we have at Revere, Chelsea, Charlestown, Mass General has, they have recovery coaches now. Um, I work at the West End Clinic at Mass General Hospital. We have a recovery coach. It is a really wonderful program that helps uh, patients meet with a recovery coach with a lived, learned experience of a substance use history and have the ability to help um, not just coach them, but guide them, uh, check in with them, counsel them. It's, it's really a wonderful opportunity to meet with someone, um, you know, outside of meeting with like an AA or NA sponsor. Any other programs and services with the Mass General you'd like to highlight to the audience? Oh, sure. My, well, I could be here all day doing that. <laughs> You know, some of the things that are really wonderful at, at Mass General Hospital is we've got the entire continuum of care um, when it comes to mental health and substance use disorders. You know, we've got really wonderful treatment that we can provide to patients in an emergency crisis uh, situation. In our emergency department, we've got really wonderful um, and in, wonderful inpatient psychiatric unit, uh, like 11 here at Mass General Hospital. We have really wonderful psych triage and addiction consult teams that are in bed within the medical inpatient settings at the hospital hospital. We also have a huge number of outpatient treatment that we can provide patients, both for psychiatric needs within our Department of Psychiatric Department of Psychiatry, but also within addiction and substance use treatment. So we've got really wonderful programs when it comes to child psychiatry, adolescent psychiatry, and adult psychiatry. We've also got great programs for substance use disorders and other addictions. We've got programs like our Addiction Recovery Management Service for young adults and teens. I think that's like 
um, maybe like 26 and below. We've got the West End Clinic that does a really wonderful job in helping patients with co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders, 18 and above. We've got great facilities and programs that are outpatient. I could talk about this all day. Um, that are for people with like really like on-demand psychiatric, but also on-demand like substance use treatment. When we think of like our bridge clinic that we have, we also have a hope clinic. We also have the ability to really meet patients' needs. So when they come in, we've got wonderful providers can figure out where do they fit in the continuum of care and how can we continue to help them with their patient goals. So Mass General really has a lot of great stuff. And that's just at Mass General as a whole. We've also got our community providers, Revere, Chelsea, Everett, North End, you know, everywhere basically that we've got a facility that offer really comprehensive mental health and substance use treatment and evaluation. If you want to learn more about any of these programs and services, do you have a number that we can call for more information? Go online. I totally recommend going to the Mass General website. It's incredibly informative. It's an innovative website. It's updated all the time. Um, you can look at the Department of Psychiatry's website and there's different links to child psychiatry, um, adolescent psychiatry, adult. There's a whole area there for substance use disorders. And um, if you're looking for Mass General specific, that's what I would do. You also have the opportunity um, to call the hospital and just tell them you want to speak with someone in psychiatry. And we've got a kind of psychiatry direct access line for new admissions. And then when in doubt, you know, when you're meeting with one of your healthcare providers, like your primary care doctor, talk to them, ask them questions or a pediatrician, um, reach out for help in that way as well. With um, the current environment with the pandemic, are you still seeing patients, not you, but like the programs at Mass General, um, are they still seeing patients? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So we are working at a hospital over time to try to meet the needs of people with mental health and substance use disorders. Our emergency room never closes, so that's always there if there is a crisis. But we are seeing everyone we were seeing before, if not more patients and families now. We have the ability to provide some in-person treatment, depending on the safety, um, but we also have the ability to provide care um, virtually through telehealth, um, telephone connections. So if you don't have smartphone, you don't have a way to access Zoom or your patient gateway through Mass General account, we have the ability to access care there. We also have the ability for patients to access care through video conferencing, you know, video teleconferencing to provide um, telehealth and telemental health. So there's no reason not to have access to care at this time. And if there is a problem, you know, my email is at the end of that. You can always contact me and I'll, I can help advocate and make a referral for you to, to access treatment. Great. How about yourself? Are you involved in any particular program or service? Um, I would not be, I'm certainly involved in a lot of self-care and a lot of making sure that I advocate for myself because as a provider, I think that if you don't take good care of yourself, you're not going to have the ability to provide excellent care like we do at Mass General Hospital to others. Mm -hmm. um, at this time, I'm, I'm not in any sort of, of treatment, but I do very much uh, make sure that I'm, I'm cognizant of nutrition and sleep, health and wellness, good self-care as a provider. Great. So we'll give it a minute to see if anyone else has any questions for you. In the meantime, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share with the audience? Uh, let me see. Let me think about what I could say. Um, I am really so excited that I had the opportunity to come and speak with you all today. There is a bevy of resources available, um, not just in Boston, not just at Mass General Hospital, and not just in Massachusetts, but really all over the country when it comes for family, friends, loved ones to get engaged and get really informed about what they can do to help people with mental health and substance use disorders. So I really encourage that if you have a question or if you're inquisitive, look at some of the resources that I provided today, reach out to someone, um, reach out to the loved one that you think is struggling and let them know that you care. But there's such a multitude of resources and um, we have increased access to care now because of the, the, you know, the pandemic. And we've also got increased resources because of the pandemic that there's really no excuse for someone not to either be engaged in care or, or not to have a family member engaged in some form of supportive treatment. All right. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Blewett. Yeah. As mentioned, we have recorded this session. If you're interested in viewing the recording, feel free to visit the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum Hiking Center. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Blewett, for a very helpful presentation. I think we'll be ending a few minutes early, so have a great rest of the day. Thank you so much. <laughs>